and we will go yeah. on to our next speaker, um, Alessandro Esposito. So, Alessandro, are you here? Yeah. Hi. There. Yes. Yes, there's a uh, nice, nice. Okay, we can see your talk. So this is this is working. So, Alessandro, thanks a lot for um, for taking part. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. So just short introduction to Alessandro. So Alessandro um, did his PhD in biophysics in 2006, working at the University of Utrecht and the European Neuroscience Institute in Göttingen. And he was awarded for the Sergio Gianni Award by the Italian Society of Pure and Applied Biophysics. So he is a really physics guy um, and um, maybe not all from the biologist thing, so maybe he can explain me some, some more things. Um, he then moved on to the University of Cambridge and spent time to the applied quantitative imaging techniques and contributing to define better models um, of red blood cells homeostasis infected by malaria. 2009, Alessandro was awarded for the Life Science Interface Fellowship by the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. Um, for development of bio, biochemical, I'm sorry for that, multiplexing imaging. So he did already a lot of imaging. Um, he then refocused on cancer biology and um, at, at the unit, in, at the cancer unit in Cambridge. And um, now he is um, working in genetic and non-genetic hortogenity and cell-cell communica communication in cell fate decisions. Um, yes, so the title of your talk is Life Cell Imaging of Biochemical Networks and Cellular Decisions, and I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Alessandro. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for uh, you and your, the other organizers for inviting me to this very nice event. Um, I, I assume that uh, you are receiving me well and you see my presentation, otherwise Okay, perfect. Um, to do, to do. So, um, I will browse through not only the physics, I mean, 50% of my work since a few years is actually um, uh, uh, biology, and I will um, have different sections of my presentations. Don't worry if, uh, if you see that I'm not going to finish in time, just stop me and uh, uh, is a very modular uh, type of presentation. Um, so first of all, also uh, a big thanks to uh, my group, Susan, Andrew, Pablo, Kushali, Anni, Omid, and Callum here. Uh, we are a group of about a third of uh, physicists and engineers and the others biologists. And as I was mentioning, um, I, I currently I refocus my work on oncogenic signaling and heterogeneity in cancer uh, evolution. Uh, before starting with the science, also a big thank to the uh, founders, uh, the MRC, and for core funding and uh, Cancer Research UK, and particularly Ashok Venkataraman, who um, uh, supported the work that I will show you for uh, several years, a former director of the uh, unit. But I would like to start describing um, what has uh, been fascinating me and what triggered the development I'm going to show you uh, today. As you pointed out, I come from physics, but I really wanted to do um, um, biology. And, uh, and all the developments we are trying to do, well, some of them is just for the fun of it, admittingly, but uh, the large majority of them is actually uh, to address specific biological questions. Uh, what was fascinating me is that a single uh, fertilized egg, um, so a single uh, genome, uh, can give rise to so many different uh, types of tissues, so many types, so many um, phenotypes, phenotypes that can be stable or transient. And this in, during development happened because of uh, cellular decisions. But cellular decisions are also important uh, uh, in adulthood. Uh, our adult bodies, in average, are made of 3 trillion cells, and here I'm not even considering the hematopoietic system. One billion of these cells is dying every uh, single day. But this means that by the end of our lifetime, um, our bodies had been made about 30 trillion cells, the large majority of which is already dead. And to maintain homeostasis, cells have to constantly divide, die, specialize, migrate. Or in other words, they have to constantly take choices. So these choices are taken by a complex network of chemical uh, reactions that actually form the brain of, uh, uh, of the cell. 
There is one aspect uh, of uh, um, cellular decisions that is very, very interesting for me. And I would like to illustrate with a little game uh, that uh, when I go to workshops, I usually I present in a very interactive way. Um, I'm afraid that uh, I tried on Zoom once and didn't work so well. So I will anyway uh, try to browse through, uh, through it because it explains very well um, what I mean with cellular decisions and, uh, and heterogeneity. So in order to illustrate this point, uh, I will provide uh, you uh, with a road, a zebra crossing, a traffic light that can be green or red. Therefore, the decision that you need to make is actually very simple. Uh, the traffic light is red, you don't cross. The traffic light is uh, green, you cross the street. So I usually I present uh, to the audience this question. So if the traffic light is green, there is no traffic at the horizon, are you going to cross the road? And uh, of course, the large majority of people is answering uh, yes, with the exception of the odd person that remains on the pavement apparently uh, forever. Or maybe they're a bit too shy to answer usually. So the opposite question is, if the traffic light is red and the road is very busy, are you going to cross? And of course, the large majority of people is not going to cross. But now there are intermediate situations. I mean, the traffic light can be only red or green, but there could be situations where there is no traffic but there is a bus waiting for you at the opposite side of the road and you are about to miss the bus. Are you going to cross or not? A bit more people are going to cross. And then in the same scenario, if you're actually quite late for a job interview, well, probably you're going to cross in this case. And then in the, you can imagine that you are at two in the morning and uh, there is no traffic, but there is still a traffic light that is on and is red. Are you going to cross? Well, most people usually cross anyway. But what if you have the exactly same scenario, but we are in Germany and some of you is in Germany? Well, uh, uh, I, can tell, I can make this joke because I lived in for four years in, in Göttingen and there was more German than Germans. And uh, while my friend Germans would cross, actually I would stay on the, on the, on the, side, on the pavement because I like rules and I like uh, to respect them. Uh, but the point I want to make is that uh, different people has different attitudes and they will uh, take different decisions, even in situations where in principle, the rules are very clear. So it depends on the rules, the context, individual differences, and the cells have to take decisions, but in a plethora of signals coming from the extra and the intracellular environment. So they have to make very tough decisions. And in uh, uh, cancer, cancer is often defined as a disease of uh, the genome. Um, we are investigating uh, cellular decisions at, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in situations where there is DNA damage or there are mutations that are offset in different types of decisions. I like to just mention, and then I move on on threat, um, what, how is cancer defined, at least for our um, uh, public health system is cancer is a condition where cells in a specific part of the body grow and reproduce uncontrollably. Uh, so the concept is uncontrollably. They don't take any more the right uh, decision. So in this regard, cancer is a disease of homeostasis or a disease of cell choice. And one of these cell choice is uh, uh, taken during uh, the cell cycle. Um, for example, it's called the DNA damage checkpoint. For those of you that might not know, uh, cells that are um, uh, proliferating, uh, they undergo a cell cycle, G1, G2, and uh, phase and mitosis. And during the cell cycle, cells can experience DNA damage, uh, either, either because um, um, mutagens from the environment cause DNA damage, or from uh, endogenous mechanisms like uh, uh, re DNA replication itself. Um, this is perfectly normal and cells have mechanisms to arrest the cell cycle and give enough time to the uh, DNA damage repair mechanisms to indeed repair the DNA damage. Um, failing to do so uh, will have to trigger tumor suppressive mechanisms like cellular death or, um, uh, or senescence in order to avoid um, the induction of uh, dangerous uh, DNA damage mutations. So uh, we have studied for several years DNA damage, and here I will show you specifically uh, one project, probably two. Uh, and the first one is starting with uh, what happens if cells have unrepairable DNA damage? How do they decide to uh, die? Uh, so how do we study? Uh, how do we study biochemistry inside the cells? Of course, the answer is foster resonance transfer. So probably I wouldn't have been invited here uh, today. And uh, and uh, you will. 
hear a lot about uh, you know what FRAT is, um, and of course uh, I will browse very fast through this prime this FRAT primers I, because I just want to point out one element of it that maybe not. Uh, always uh, discussed. So of course we have donor fluorophores here exemplified with a fluorescent protein and you can have an acceptor fluorophores and when they're in close proximity as you have been already described you can have FRAT. Now the important uh, part that I, I will uh, stress here and, and later is that the acceptor molecule does not have to be fluorescent. It has to be a chromophore in the sense that can be, you should be able capable to absorb light in the right emissions a, a, a excitation spectrum. Or a, of course, for FRET, uh, it is about it has to be having energy levels that are compatible with the, the energy level of the donor fluorophore to um, uh, undergo energy transfer. So FRET, we know, is uh, um, uh, quenching the fluorescence intensity of the donor, sensitize the emission of the of the acceptor fluorophore if it was a fluorescent molecule. It is decreasing the fluorescence lifetime of the donor. It is changing the apparent uh, 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 lifetime of the combined donor and the sensitized em uh, emission. And can be measured, like was mentioned before, by fluorescence anisotropy. Uh, uh, from the acceptor, and particularly when the donor and the acceptors are the same molecules, is uh, uh, what we call homofret. And as other speakers I mentioned, also fluorescence range transfer and flame can probe uh, fractions of uh, non-interactive pools of uh, donors and acceptors. So this slide is going to be in scale, and I just want to stress that all the developments that we do in our lab are dedicated to increase the biochemical resolution in fluorescence microscopy or to make it faster, simpler, and more cost uh, effective. As you know, uh, a fluorescent protein is about a couple of nanometers. Uh, and therefore, when two fluorescent proteins are in the same pixel on a confocal microscope, we know that uh, um, they might or they might not be um, interacting with each other. Uh, super resolution techniques um, are, have a great advantage and now is pushing these boundaries lower and lower to probe uh, shorter distances. Uh, and, uh, but FRET has the same resolution of any microscope you are going to use. If it's a wide field microscope, it's going to be the resolution of a wide field microscope. Uh, if it's a confocal microscope, it's going to be the resolution of a confocal microscope. But we are sensitive, as described so far, by events that are below five nanometers, which we can conveniently exploit uh, in order to uh, measure uh, biochemical reactions inside uh, the cells through conformational changes and, uh, and similar um, uh, things. So just to give another scale with our worst enemy of the 2020, so this is a, a coronavirus um, a particle and uh, if you would have um, uh, two uh, fluorescent proteins on the same spike proteins, you might uh, uh, observe threat, but if I separate it, uh, uh, you wouldn't measure threat. Uh, uh, most of us uh, have been shown uh, in fluorescent protein and linking domains uh, to uh, sense binding, uh, ligands, personalization modifications, the activity of uh, proteases, uh, and uh, so on. I, I actually love biochemistry in general, not just uh, imaging. And, uh, you know, traditional biochemistry like uh, Western blotting is great and is still uh, quite used not only in general labs, but also in a specialist lab, lab like ours. And uh, we can measure expression levels, interactions through CoAP, post translation and modifications. But of course, as you all know, it is quite invasive and, uh, and is measuring only uh, sample averages. So effectively cause the loss of uh, cellular integrity and identity. But it's an important thing to notice that uh, all these uh, uh, techniques that separate uh, chemical moieties separate the, uh, these moieties through space. Um, in fluorescent microscopy, we map space, so we don't have the luxury to be to use space to separate uh, chemistry, but we need to use the sp spectroscopic properties of uh, light. Um, uh, FRAT, FLIM imaging techniques uh, might suffer uh, of low throughput, high cost, low biochemical resolving powers, all, all, all things that have been uh, constantly improved, in, not only from uh, academic developers like us, but also from uh, um, uh, uh, companies uh, like those that are sponsoring um, this, um, um, uh, this workshop. 
so the point is that uh, uh, FLIM uh, can, and uh, microscopy in general, can access um, by preserving the integrity of a cell. We can follow a cell, we can study cell fate, we can do so in a more native environment, and we can uh, understand, we can characterize cell to cell variability. So how do we multiplex uh, FRET? Um, uh, how do we multiplex uh, biochemistry? So um, one um, um, example that uh, a comparison that I have been um, uh, using uh, since uh, a while lately um, is that of buckets. So uh, fluorescence is like filling a, a bucket um, with water. Fluorescence is going to be drop of water that are going out of this uh, bucket. And uh, what is FRET? Uh, FRET is nothing else than a second hole uh, at the bottom of this uh, bucket. And uh, the water will uh, spill into this yellow bucket. There will be not only less uh, water uh, spilling from the uh, blue bucket in this lower blue bucket, but there will be also it will spend less time to empty this uh, blue bucket. And this is the analogy with the, the shortening of, of the fluorescence lifetime. Um, this is an ideal uh, case scenario, but uh, eventually what we measure, what we experience, particularly in sensitized emission threat, is a spectral bleed through. Uh, now, do, don't misunderstand me, sensitized emission threat is uh, still used a lot. We use sensitized emission threat probably more than FLIM, sadly, being a FLIM uh, developer, uh, for the reasons that have been discussed so far, which is uh, sometimes um, sensors do not really work with FLIM, but work best with sensitized emission, emission threat. But of course, FLIM has some advantages, and this is one of those. Um, when we tune our laser lines and our, spect our detectors uh, to detect um, uh, the donor and the acceptor fluorescence in order to make their ratio, it is practically unavoidable that some light here represented by water is uh, from the donor um, is spilled over in the acceptor channel and some light uh, uh, that uh, we use for excitation of the donor is actually exciting the acceptor. And you have all these uh, uh, crosstalks that are actually making uh, our lives a bit more complicated for, for detecting um, uh, in a quantitative way uh, uh, threat through sensitized emission threat. Uh, so this is just an, a, a focusing on these uh, spillovers of fluorescence or water. Um, um, the advantage of FLIM is that we don't have to watch the acceptor bucket. We just measure the time at, uh, with which the donor bucket is going to empty. And this is a big advantage because our acceptor bu bucket can be completely invisible we don't have to use a fluorophore. And th this to make a practical example, if you want uh, to image uh, two sensors, um, you need to use two uh, excitation wavelengths probably, and you need to have um, uh, a number of uh, detectors. If you do with flame, two, but if you do with sensitized emission threat, you need four uh, at least. Um, so uh, what we can do to rationalize the use of the visible spectrum is to use um, a different uh, stock shift of uh, fluorophore, that is the difference between the excitation and the emission wavelength. And in this case, for example, using two donors uh, that uh, are excited the same blue wavelength uh, and emit one in, the, in more, let's say, green and one more uh, red. What we can do next is what I anticipated now, is uh, we remove the fluorescence of the acceptor fluorophores by using chromoproteins, so which are dark, uh, acceptors or are in usually um, just acceptors that are very inefficient in emitting um, uh, light. And therefore, we, in this way, we can make a little bit of extra space to accommodate a, a, a third uh, flat pair. And the added advantage is that um, uh, we can excite all these three fluorophores with one wavelength. The big disadvantage is that we need flame because we don't have any more acceptor. We need to do everything through the donor uh, lifetimes. Uh, so this was the plan quite a few years ago now um, uh, to generate um, three fret pairs that can be excited by the photon excitation at about 800, 840, 850 nanometers, um, and perhaps leaving some space for uh, light inducible enzymes like I will show you uh, a, a little bit uh, later. And uh, so what we do, what we did a few years ago is to generate these uh, fret pairs 
Uh, I'm not going to enter the details because we have a bio archive um, 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 manuscript um, uh, published a couple of years ago and still in the pain of the peer referee of a peer review uh, in different journals, uh, but it's based on a blue, green, and uh, uh, red um, fluorescent proteins, all excited at 140 nanometers, and uh, uh, very dark um, um, uh, acceptor uh, fluorophores. This is actually real data, so it's very similar to what we um, wanted to achieve. In the, 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 the stronger colors uh, refers to only the donors, and the more pastel colors are actually referring to a uh, FRET fusion construct. Um, each of the construct is exhibited about 40% of FRET efficiency. You see the FRET and no FRET uh, constructs. Actually, uh, the, the spectra is very similar. Um, there is some residual fluorescence from uh, this uh, first um, acceptor pro, um, uh, fluorophores, but it's very minimal and we can cope with this with mathematics. As instrumentations back then, uh, I mean, we started these projects about 10 years ago, there was not a system that was fast enough to do our uh, measurements. And so what we had developed is uh, um, uh, uh, working around a Leica SP5 multiphoton microscope, we integrated it with the three hybrid um, uh, detection systems. Um, and uh, uh, we use both becker Inkle and pico quant electronic, uh, sorry, becker Inkle and uh, um, uh, like electronics. Um, pico quant now is doing electronics that is fast enough to make these kind of measurements. Back then we developed our own electronics. Effectively, what you need is the time uh, to digital converters that back then we bought from Surface Concept that can support much higher acquisition rates than uh, traditional electronics without getting artifacts. And I'm not going to illustrate this uh, uh, today. It's published and it's very technical. Um, uh, what we do use is uh, phasers, but we use phasers to as a, a data reduction algorithms to mix uh, the, uh, the spectroscopic information that we acquire and to transform the data from kind of you know, but a, a, a photophysical space to a biochemical space, which where we image these three biochemical reactions. Uh, back then, we are probably naively we thought to start um, a, a project based on uh, caspase biology because caspase has a very uh, simple to uh, uh, to clone, um, and we wanted to discriminate between two. Uh, different models that were present in the literature, whereby in the presence of DNA damage, uh, caspase 2 or caspase 9s were considered the like apical caspases that would trigger a, 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 the cascade of caspases uh, underpinning um, 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 apoptosis. Uh, so we converted these three sensors that I've shown you with three flat pairs that we show you in sensors for caspase 2, caspase 3, caspase 9 with these three different um, uh, uh, substrate that are preferentially uh, cleaved by these uh, uh, three caspases. But, uh, you know, I cut a very long short, uh, very long story short, um, uh, just illustrating what we have done with this uh, data. At the bottom here, you will see color images of the three channels. This is a, a just a cropped image of a single cell, just to focus your attention. And you will see here a movie that lasts for about 16 hours with images collected every 15 minutes. The microscope is jumping in different fields of views in these 16 hours to collect this movie. At time zero, we actually add a cisplatin, which is a DNA damaging agent, uh, which damages DNA in an irreversible way and is actually used in, uh, in the clinics. Um, uh, cells, as you saw from the bottom, a certain point will die with this uh, phenotype. I will anticipate a little bit uh, something I will tell you later. This is um, uh, necrosis. Um, and here on the top, uh, you see a, a plot of uh, the relative uh, frac the fraction of sensors that have been cleaved over the total over time. And this is for the three caspases, two, three, nine. Uh, and here is a parametric plot of caspase two, three, and, uh, uh, and, and nine. You see this uh, very, uh, very sharp trajectory for activated to not activated. But you also see that caspase nine in these conditions is not very, um, is not activated very robustly. This and another cells actually is adjacent to this in the same cover slip, same exact treatment. It actually activates suddenly caspases uh, in a different at a different time. 
and the phenotype of the cells is very different. Of course, you will recognize that is uh, apoptosis. And in this specific case, you see that uh, uh, the trajectory, the biochemical trajectory of these cells in this three-dimensional biochemical space is different. Now, two cells do not make a statistic. So we spend years because these experiments are quite difficult, uh, were at least quite difficult to do without um, simple commercial uh, microscope to do this kind of experiments. Um, and uh, um, uh, we did uh, uh, about 700, 800 experiments. These are just controls where we add cisplatin only and we follow um, uh, the cells. And you see this uh, very um, slow activation of caspases, which is this, of course, is not what happened, but is what you would measure with the Western blot. Now, we do have single cell data in the memory of the computer, and we can classify the different behavior of the cells. And we know that there is about 20% of the cells that are actually not responding. So these are single cell traces where um, each line of this plot is a cell. Uh, the column is caspase 2, 3, and 9, and the color is blue is a low, a low um, uh, cleavage and the red is high uh, cleavage. Uh, there is about 20% of the cells, um, sorry, 50% of the cells that are actually responding with all the caspases robustly and 20% that respond only with space two and three. So the first benefit of multiplexing and using imaging and biochemical imaging is that we can reveal the existence of three different um, uh, populations. We can average them now and uh, show, when I show these kind of plots, is always 95% um, um, confidence intervals of the responses. And we do see these three different um, uh, populations. What is interesting is that if you check the average and uh, this population, this 50% are actually practically identical because it is the dominating populations. Um, the other two, they are practically invisible and you wouldn't know that they exist, either if you do a Western blot or if you do uh, image analysis without analyzing single cells. Uh, the other benefit is that we can synchronize now the cells in the memory of the computer. This is an asynchronous process. The time of activation of caspases is random. And once we do so, we can reconstruct the actual prototypical um, uh, activation of caspases. That is really fast. Uh, within 20 minutes, it's going from zero to all and uh, it is uh, a bit slower for those cells that do not activate um, casp uh, caspase uh, 9. And because you might see from this plot that there are about a couple of hours later, and after a lot of statistics that I'm going to bypass for the time being, um, we can describe with this plot um, uh, what is actually happening in the cells if the um, systems would be homogeneous and synchronous, which is not, and if you do the wrong assumption, you measure something like this that is completely different from the reality. Uh, so naively at the beginning, uh, um, we um, wanted to distinguish between these two different um, uh, models. Uh, we uh, realized that things are a bit more complicated um, and, uh, and uh, that uh, these uh, two different phenotypes, and here we, we have done many more experiments that are not necessarily with flim that are related to apoptosis and necrosis. We were able also to uh, measure uh, ATP concentrations in an independent experiments where we have shown that this is also related to um, a ATP, uh, to in a, the metabolic state of uh, the cells. Uh, those cells that are undergoing necrosis are doing so um, at the later time point uh, because uh, probably because we didn't establish a cause and effect um, uh, link because they have a lower um, amount of ATP. Um, so anyway, why uh, do we care uh, if cells die of apoptosis or necrosis? Uh, because necrosis is considered, let's say, quite a messy business where uh, cells, instead of having um, retaining their content and just cleaving their content is actually spilling their content in the tissues and they can cause inflammation. And this we know nowadays that can be either a good or a bad thing for um, cancer therapy. Now I would like to move on uh, on optogenetics just very briefly. Uh, this is, has been, you know, one of the most exciting development that I have been following over the last uh, um, uh, 10 years uh, uh, for us. It has been also difficult um, uh, uh, to establish um, uh, reproducible assays 
um, uh, with these uh, tools, and certainly we didn't arrive yet to the stage where we can integrate with uh, um, with Flim, although this is still our target. However, we also had very nice success stories, and I want to tell you one of them. Uh, this um, is uh, uh, Vivid. The, this one domain, but have been engineered by um, colleagues to absorb a different um, wavelengths, and when are doing so, two different what so-called magnet domains can interact with each other um, uh, uh, in a heterotypic uh, way. And those proteins are nothing else than the eyes of uh, lower organisms like um, um, cyanobacteria, molds, or even plants. Uh, and now there is a, a huge amount of uh, um, uh, protein domains available in the literature, a little bit like uh, you know, the revolution that we had experienced from the 90s with the fluorescent proteins. Um, uh, we have done quite a few different uh, experiments with different um, um, uh, light-inducible enzymes. What I'm going to show you is uh, one particular uh, kinases. And I'm showing you uh, what we have done in a different, in a different aspect of the same project. So what happened when cells can repair DNA damage because we use a different uh, uh, chemicals? When do they repair and progress um, through the cell cycle? So uh, a little bit by chance, we discovered that uh, um, there are um, oscillatory uh, behavior of uh, mitogenic pathways, uh, uh, here represented uh, with a Western blot by um, uh, phospho-ERC, uh, uh, and overlaid here with P53. P53 is known from the work of Lahav and colleagues since many years, since several years, um, that is presenting this, exhibiting this oscillatory behavior. Um, there is, from our point of view, there is no reason uh, from a biological perspective to have a, a concurrent oscillations in a, a nematogenic pathway, particularly in the G2 checkpoint that is generally regarded as insensitive to um, uh, extracellular uh, signaling. Um, it is important to notice that uh, um, the presence of uh, uh, stable or pulsatile um, uh, signaling is actually determining um, uh, different, the expression of different uh, target genes, and eventually, therefore, uh, the um, uh, different um, uh, cellular states, cellular programs, and decisions between um, them. Very briefly, because I just want to illustrate uh, just one result of optogenetics, when we have these um, uh, cells, uh, we were working on MCF7s um, that, uh, um, that are treated with, uh, with the vehicle controls, um, about 50% uh, are progressing through uh, uh, G2 when imaged from uh, G2. Um, in the presence of DNA damage using NCS, um, uh, of course, we have a, a DNA damage, um, a cell cycle arrest at G2. And when we inhibit uh, MAPK signaling to a MAC inhibitor, we have a further a decrease of cells that are progressing through mitosis. We have a, a stronger enforced um, um, DNA down checkpoint, which this is not really uh, uh, surprising. What has surprised us is uh, that when we use um, um, growth factor like HRG, which induce uh, high uh, and stable um, um, MAPK signaling, contrary to other that uh, are only responding in a transient way, we have a, a, a progression uh, through mitosis in the presence of DNA damage, so we can weaken the DNA damage um, checkpoint. So that, of course, um, was, uh, um, um, we were uncertain that this would have happened for MAPK signaling, uh, particularly uh, uh, ERK, uh, because um, all growth factors are activating a, a number of receptors, which in turn will uh, activate a number of pathways because they are very often very well highly connected with each other. So what we have done is to use an optogenetic tools from Aoki's lab, which is a light inducible um, uh, rough uh, kinase. Uh, this is used by, with blue light, you translocate um, a, a, a constantly active uh, rough to the plasma membrane where it will exert its function. And with this, we were able uh, to activate by light um, um, a kinase, a KRAF. So we are going to probe a single uh, arm of these uh, networks of uh, um, networks of uh, chemical reactions. Here is shown by uh, using MCF7s under the parental line or the one that is stably uh, transfected with OptoRAF, and you see that uh, 
with light, when there is plus, we can induce the phosphorylation of ERK in the um, uh, transgenic lines and not in the parental lines. And when we do the same experiment, but with light, again here, we have a release of cells, a partial release of cells from the DNA damage checkpoint, uh, demonstrating that uh, um, P53 and MAPK signaling pathways are uh, cooperating to maintaining, in a sense, uh, the cells in an ambiguous state that is conducive to DNA damage. Um, uh, and uh, while the cells is deciding if, if, it, if to withdraw from the cell cycle, either triggering senescence or cell cycle arrest. And this, we have noticed this in many of the um, uh, projects that we, have, we are doing. Very often a cell decision is based on unstable state, in this case, conducive to repair, and where this is pushing one direction is going to trigger cell survivor or cellular death. If you're interested in the details, you can visit our website where there is a summary of all of this work. So I'm wondering, I lost track about how much time I spoke. Um, yeah, we, are, we are nearly at the end. So okay. two, so two, I will, two uh, three slides more if you, if you have it. Um, yeah, no, that, that's fine. That's I just fine. want to mention uh, one technique which we call hyperdimensional image and microscopy is published uh, uh, last year on the physical journal. So you can uh, go there to check the paper. But just want to mention, if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that we can't use space to uh, mix um, uh, different moieties. We need to use the spectral, uh, sorry, the spectroscopic features of the samples. And these are not just lifetime, it's not just intensity, but we can use an array of detectors or linear um, uh, detectors in order to sense the different properties of lights and therefore to unmix um, uh, enzymatic activity with kind of, a, I like to call it a kind of an optical gel rather than a physical um, uh, gel. And usually um, people is focusing on a single um, uh, property of light, like uh, um, um, intense, uh, intensity in a single color, or a couple of colors or fluorescence lifetimes. Here we have developed a system that can detect uh, 16 different colors, uh, two different polarization states for each color and uh, 64 time beams. So lifetimes for each color and polarization states. Um, so uh, these techniques have gone through different uh, iterations. Uh, and again, all, this is all literature, which passed through also the um, construction of uh, what is called spectral polymetry in, uh, in imaging, uh, the construction of new type of detectors and the definition of the concept of biochemical resolving power that helped us to optimize this type of uh, um, uh, techniques. And uh, I just want to illustrate how this, this type of microscopy is sensitive to changes of uh, um, uh, spectra, fluorescence lifetimes. Uh, it allows us to, to ask to the peak assignment. Thanks to, if you can imagine, like uh, multi um, uh, orthogonal techniques for um, uh, proteomics uh, pro pro uh, separations or uh, multi uh, spectra or mu multi dimensional NMR um, uh, spectra. With increasing um, uh, dimensionality of the spectra, we can enhance the separability of these uh, uh, sensors. So more channels within a certain limit will allow us to be uh, better in multiplexing or just achieving uh, better resolving um, power. So I, I only had just a few extra conclusive slides. I just want to make one point uh, to conclude. I'm actually, I think that microscopy is always um, a very exciting um, area, uh, always kind of in revolution. It never stops. And what is exciting for me in particular is that uh, now we can really start to reverse engineer the cells and to understand how it's going to take uh, decisions. And we are doing it not only with, uh, uh, with FRET, uh, with uh, FRET multiplexing, but also now by changing, um, by probing um, uh, optically um, uh, biochemical reactions. And I like to think that it's a little bit by, uh, by having, you know, a different electrodes uh, on, on a patient or if when we do uh, a, a functional imaging in, uh, in a, a MRI um, uh, and uh, checking the response of, of the patients. And with this, I really thank you all for your attention. And I'm, I welcome any questions uh, now or even um, uh, later on Twitter or any other media. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Alessandro, for your for your talk. And I guess yeah, that's that's always possible. So if you have questions for for a talk you haven't um, yet, so send us. We will provide this to the speakers and see that we can answer the questions. So we have some. So I will start with the first question from Eleanor. So have you ever combined FLIM and optogenetics in the same experiment? And how are you doing it, if this is possible? So um, we have a specific grant now from CIUK, um, uh, which is there is uh, this is called Oncolive, and there is a website oncolive.online, uh, which has sadly um, hugely been affected by the lockdown um, because uh, we just recruited a poster that was doing exactly that um, a month before um, the lockdown. Uh, but yes, what we are trying to do now is to combine at least um, one uh, color uh, flame with uh, um, with uh, um, optogenetic tools. So using uh, uh, the blue frat pairs uh, together with the red infrared optogenetic systems. And we are trying to do so um, with, uh, it's a very complex project with the uh, uh, 3D um, organic cultures on a light sheet microscope. And in this case, uh, of course, we will use our workhorse microscope as a multi-photon system uh, by Leica, but we are developing this light sheet prototype. We are trying to integrate uh, these new mm, uh, 2D cameras uh, for FLIM. Um, I, I think uh, Gerald Holst from PCO is also online. I thought I, I saw before his name um, with, uh, with whom we are uh, trying really to integrate all, all, all of these technologies. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is a specific a technical one. So which kind of detector you were used for, for um, multispectral FLIM imaging? Uh, so for the, so for the multicolor, we are using hybrid detectors, but probably is the hyperspectral mm -hmm. uh, imaging. In that case, we are using um, the becker um 16 uh, multi-anode channels. Um, in the last iteration, which is not anymore uh, new because it's uh, uh, several years is around. It has a very high quantum efficiency and uh, we are using our own uh, spectrographs. Um, probably in the paper in 2019, we published uh, the one that was based on, uh, on older technologies, uh, but now we use direct vision prisms. Uh, we have a throughput through the spectrograph is about 80% and, uh, and uh, the sensitivity of the photocathodes of these new detectors, I mean, not completely new, but this recent detector is about uh, Forty percent. So the sen their sensitivity um, is hugely improved compared to uh, what people might have experienced, uh, let's say, ten years ago, where you would need probably ten minutes to make an image uh, in in, our, in these settings. Um, unfortunately, there is no other um, good alternative commercially uh, uh, speaking, um, and uh, and uh, we have been, uh, you know trying uh, to also do fast electronics on this, but we are waiting. I hope that uh, someone will help us to move uh, forward. Okay. So the next question is about, um, yeah, an experimental one. So why do you need so fast electronics when you just measure about four times per hour and say it's 20 minutes for reaction? So I guess this is for, for the first part of your talk. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I wasn't clear. So there are, two aspects of this question that are important. Um, first of all, when I was speaking about fast electronics, I meant for detecting uh, uh, flim, of course, we need, uh, we need detectors that can time with, uh, you know, picosynco precisions uh, in this regard fast, um, uh, the, time, the arrival time of photons. Second, uh, we need to do this with many, many photons. So we need to be able to support um, tens of megahertz, so millions of photon counts per second, uh, something that until a few years ago was not possible. In this regard, we need fast detectors um, because we were limited at about 800 kilohertz. Uh, I know that uh, um, particularly from a commercial point of view, people were pushing to you know, go faster, but if you go faster, you, you get uh, uh, artifacts that then, you know, they, they may skew your experiment. So, is better. I, I always use uh, our system in a very conservative um, region. Um, 
Now, uh, this, uh, once uh, you could do an image, a film image with a, speaking about the scanning microscope in a minute, um, nowadays we can do it in, uh, you know, five, uh, 10 seconds, again, scanning microscope. Um, we actually don't go that fast, uh, as you might have noticed. Uh, we take about 48 seconds per image, and there is actually very good reason for that. Um, the dynamic range of uh, particularly time correlated signal photon counting is very is relatively limited. What I mean with this is that let's say that you cannot count more than 10 millions or 80 million uh, photons per second. This applies for every single pixel. So if you have one pixel that is very bright, uh, you're, um, uh, you are going to uh, limit your acquisition speed to that pixel. So we use the speed in order to not have artifacts in, in any of the bright regions, but being still capable to image very in a very good way, uh, uh, also darker um, cells. And this was a problem that, you know, I actually did not anticipate it when we started the experiment because, you know, we, we use um, um, single clones uh, of uh, cell lines. They are all very similar um, expression, more or less. Um, but actually, when you study uh, apoptosis, cells will shrink suddenly and, uh, and change focal plane. So what is going to happen is going to blind a, the, the, a typical detectors that we would be using 10 years ago. So with fast electronics, we can support the imaging of uh, multiple um, uh, planes with cells of uh, very broad brightness. And therefore, we use that, that speed for dynamic range. So shortly dynamic range enhancement due to the speeds that you don't not get overlawed to, to pixels. So, and um, that you can Correct. also go through uh, the Z stack. Okay. Yes. One and last question. We, about yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So one last question because uh, then we have it. Please try to answer it short because we are already 10 minutes <laughs> behind. Um, yes. We have a, a question from Lukas uh, Windgasse, and um, he is wondering because how you can mathematically correct for the bleed through from your um, donors. Um, because he is doing also experiments like this, but only with two uh, fluorochromes and uh, acceptors. And he thinks that the, the question, or well, it's not trivial to, to refer to this bleed through problems. So, how you handle this? It is uh, absolutely uh, not trivial and, uh, and has to be done um, uh, properly. So we, we, we describe how we do it in this uh, bioarchive manuscript, but we have also, we are writing up a specific manuscript detailing all the computational uh, framework that we are, uh, we are using. But it is very important to understand, first of all, we worked for, I think, three years to create these fret pairs, which are not perfect, uh, they're not great in general, but they minimize the crosstalks to start with. So by minimizing the crosstalk to start with, we arrive into a region where mathematics, computational methods can actually work properly. And uh, so what we do is actually we use multidimensional phasers. It doesn't matter, the details do not matter. But the point is where we fingerprint the controls. So donor uh, undergoing threat, not undergoing threat. And we do typical mixing, but in a you know in a very special way that uh, we uh, is dedicated to multiplexing. Okay, thank you, Alessandro. And I guess sure. this is a good this is a good um, yeah handover to our next talk because this is also about uh, multiplexing.